Uh, Dr. Rebecca Rooney is an associate professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Waterloo, where she leads the Waterloo Wetland Lab. And Megan Jordan is also joining us, who is a Master's of Science student at the Waterloo Wetland Lab, um, also at the University of uh, Waterloo. So today, both of them will be presenting their work um, on Phragmites and also the emergency use program that's being um, done at Long Point and Rondo Provincial Park. So I'll let you take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm going to start off and then I'm going to pass it over to Megan and I'm going to come back at the end for a couple kind of larger scale lessons learned. Um, and so Megan, if you don't mind advancing the slide for us. Sure. So we're, we're going to be talking about the emergency use registration project, which um, it's a bit of a delight every year to get to come uh, to OPWG's AGM and, and give you guys all an update about the progress on this project. And it's really been a fantastic journey. And I'm not going to kind of um, go into too much detail about, um, you know, the history of the project or um, the exact process, but we're happy to answer questions about that. I just I feel like a lot of this audience has heard that kind of repeatedly. So we'd rather give more time to, to the science. But I do, before we begin, just want to acknowledge all of the many, many partners who have been, um, you know, instrumental in making this uh, project a reality. Um, and so we've been really fortunate to be able to collaborate with all of you. Many of you are represented here today. Um, but, you know, everyone from obviously the, the federal and the provincial government, as well as, you know, environmental NGOs and um, restoration agents. Uh, and different funding bodies, um, you know, have really come together to uh, make this project come to fruition. And I also want to take a moment to brag that we've actually trained, I was counting it, 18 different students, graduate students um, and undergraduate sort of summer technicians on this project. So not only are we, um, you know, undertaking a major frag control project and, and wetland restoration project, but we're also really training a lot of uh, future um, employees for your agencies and uh, and really talented ecologists. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to one of those fantastic um, ecologists in training, uh, Megan Jordan, who's a master's uh, student in our wetlands, Waterloo Wetland Lab. Um, and she's going to be talking about um, giving you basically an update in the progress over the last year um, on the efficacy monitoring component of the emergency use registration environmental monitoring that we've been leading. Megan, you want to take it over? Sure. So first, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background on our study sites. So our study sites are primarily Long Point Peninsula, which is over here on the right, and Rondo Provincial Park, which is over here on the left. Both of these wetland complexes are home to many threatened and endangered species, both plants and animals. And unfortunately, both have seen a large scale Phragmites australis invasion since the mid 1990s, which is believed to have been facilitated by a period of low water levels. And as we all know, Phragmites really loves those low water levels and is able to expand rapidly under those conditions. In order to prevent the further spread of Phragmites australis and to um, encourage the spread of native vegetation, a Phragmites australis control program was launched in 2016 by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And to date, over 1,500 hectares of invaded marsh has been treated with a glyphosate based herbicide. So, our study questions for this experiment were first of all, how will the plant communities change post treatment? Next, how will the plant, plant communities change in the long term? So, many Frag studies only last one year or less. Um, which is not really great when you're looking at the long term trajectory of the plant community. So we really wanted to not look at just one year or two years. We wanted to look beyond that up to five years. And then finally, how will the treated areas compare to the untreated areas? So the research plan for this experiment was first to survey sites at Long Point Peninsula and Rondo Provincial Park, both pre and post treatment, and then to determine how plant communities are changing from year to year. So for this experiment, we had a total of 40 control sites in areas of very high density Phragmites australis. Um, unfortunately for this experiment, those sites were actually treated in 2020, so we don't have any 2021 data for those sites. 
Um, we also have 40 treated sites in areas that were treated as part of the control program. Um, luckily, we were able to survey all 80 sites in 2016, the year before treatment took place. So we have a bit of a baseline data set for all those sites. Um, our team surveyed those plots yearly and um, collected a ton of information, but the one we'll be focusing on today is percent plant cover. So first starting out with Phragmites australis stem density in 2016, over here on the left, um, you can see before treatment took place, there is very dense Phragmites australis in the control and treatment plots. Um, and then in 2017 onward, um, after treatment took place, you see a dramatic drop in the number of Phragmites australis stems, which is really great. Um, it has remained low over the years. Uh, in a couple of the sites throughout the years, it has come back, but in relatively low densities, that has been uh, easy to manage. Next, looking at species richness, this is a measure of how many species were found in each meter squared plot. Um, before treatment took place, again, um, the control and treatment sites look very similar, similar number of species. Um, a little bit surprisingly, but understandably, in 2017 and 2018, you see a bit of a drop in the number of species in the, in the treatment plots. This is to be expected because glyphosate is a broad spectrum herbicide. It doesn't only target Phragmites. It will target any plants that are present in the area. And so it takes a couple years for the plant community to come back and reestablish a diverse community. And as you can see in the past three years, that's what it's been doing. Next, looking at Simpson's diversity, this is a measure of how diverse each of the plots were. Again, of course, before treatment took place in 2016, you see a very similar diversity between treatment and control plots. And then in 2017, you see a bit of a dip which was again to be expected due to the broad spectrum herbicide but in the years since um, that diversity has started to increase over the control plots which is really great news so it's not just enough to look at the richness and diversity in each of the plots i like to look at something called or that i've been calling it the vegetation trajectory which is kind of looking at the quality of the species that are coming back post treatment um, so as I mentioned before, there is a large open niche space that um, is left post treatment. And this is really great for native species to come along and recolonize the area and potentially reestablish a diverse community. However, it also leaves a great big open space for invasive species to come in and establish and um, potentially cause a secondary invasion. So when I'm talking about invasives, I'm not only talking about Phragmites, but also European frogbait, Eurasian milfoil, and invasive cattail, all of which are invasive species in North American wetlands. Um, on the right side here, this is a picture I took in a treated site in 2020. Um, the green down here, that's not grass, nor is it um, solid land. That's a very dense frogbait mat that has established in this treated area, and frogbait is awful because it's very hard to swim through if you're an animal and blocks a ton of light if you're a plant that's trying to live underneath it. So very problematic for the plant communities here. So let's take a look at how the vegetation communities have changed throughout the years. So here is a map of Long Point with um, each point being representing each site from 2017 to 2021. Uh, showing if it's more invasive dominated, native dominated, or having no vegetation. And the trends in Long Point here are very clear. You can see in the first couple years post treatment, many of the sites were very invasive dominated, primarily with frog bit. Um, but however, as the years have changed, or as the years have passed, that has changed to uh, become more native dominated with plants such as nodding water nymph and Canadian waterweed, which are aquatic species that are native to Canada, which is really great news. The trends in Rondo are a little less clear, but they still follow the same trajectory as um, the Long Point sites, with the couple years post-treatment being heavily invasive dominated and the past couple years being more native dominated. So I think this really goes to show that 
long-term projects in Phragmites Australis research are really important because if you just looked at the couple years post-treatment, it would be kind of a sad story, but we're starting to see a return to native dominant uh, plants, which is really great news. So again, when you put all that information together, the trends are very clear. First couple of years post-treatment, tons of invasive dominated plots, but in the past couple of years, more na native dominated plots, which is, like I've said before, really great news. So in conclusion, species richness and diversity is increasing in the treated sites. Open niche space afforded by the Phragmites australis treatment allowed for those secondary invasions, primarily from frog bit. And finally, that invasive dominated sites are transitioning into native dominated sites. So if you look at the time period that this experiment took place from 2016 to 2021, Lake Erie water levels have been very high. However, as it's been mentioned a couple times today, um, lake levels are expected to drop and have already started to drop actually. And so now that we know what has come back during those high water level years, how can we be proactive in determining what may come back in those low water years? Well, we can do that using something called a seed bank experiment. So this is a great tool that can help predict what may repopulate the area in lower water levels. And the seed bank, if you don't know, consists of the top, primarily of the top two centimeters of sediment. This is where uh, seeds from living plants will fall and collect in um, under the water in the sediment. Um, from there, they can either perish due to old age or environmental conditions or emerge under ideal environmental conditions and turn into a seedling. It's also important to note that longevity in the seed bank is quite variable with um, some species only lasting about a growing season, others lasting up to decades. Um, and many species require low water levels, which we are expected to see in the upcoming years to emerge. And that includes not only Phragmites australis, but many native uh, species as well. So my study questions for this, this experiment were First of all, will, will the viable Phragmites australis seeds persist in the seed bank after treatment has taken place? Next, will viable native seeds persist in the seed bank after being stuck under uh, dense Phragmites australis for so long? And number three, with low water levels predicted, what will dominate post-treatment Phragmites australis seedlings or that native vegetation? So the research plant plan for this experiment was to first collect seed bank samples from invaded, treated, and native vegetation sites, then to grow those seedlings in a greenhouse experiment, and finally to analyze the emergence of those seedlings to find answers to my study questions. So for this experiment, we chose a total of 60 sites, 20 control sites in areas of very dense Phragmites australis, 20 treated sites in areas that previously had very dense Phragmites australis but were treated as part of the 2016 treatment program, and finally 20 reference sites in areas that had never been invaded and therefore were never treated, and because of the nature of the area they tended to be a bit more cattail heavy. Sample collection took place in July and August of 2020, and at each of the sites, we collected a seed bank sample, which like I mentioned before, consists of the top two centimeters of sediment. So what we did is we collected soil core samples and cut off the top two centimeters and collected that as the seed bank sample. Once back at the lab, we sieved them, each of those samples to remove any large debris, turians and Phragmites australis rhizomes and stolons. This was of particular importance for Phragmites because it is able to reproduce vegetatively with rhizomes and stolons, and we wanted to ensure that any seedlings that were emerging came from the seeds themselves. So <clears throat> for this experiment, we chose two different watering regimes to hopefully encourage the emergence of all of the seeds from the seed bank um, that were present in those samples. So the first one was a flooded regime where we maintained water levels two to four centimeters above the soil surface. And then the other was a saturated condition where we maintained soil mo moisture, but um, the samples were never flooded. Um, and myself and my volunteers gladly went to the greenhouse every one to two days and watered the 
days, seedlings every one to two days for about seven months during the middle of a pandemic, which was more fun than it sounds. Um, seedlings were identified via the emergence method, which states that once a seedling develops identifiable features, it is removed to allow for more resources for the other seedlings to grow. And here are some of my favorite seedlings that emerge, the first one being Nagus flexilis, which is not a water nymph, one of those native aquatic species that I mentioned earlier. Next one being Urtica dioica, which is stinging nettle. I didn't really even have to use a key to identify this at all. I just let it sting me about 20 times in the greenhouse and that's how I got a positive identification. Um, next one, Lythrum salicaria, that's purple loose strife, another invasive species in North American wetlands. And finally, Phragmites australis, which we found plenty of. So once no further seedlings emerged for an entire week, we stirred them to ensure that all viable seeds had the chance to emerge. And finally, once this, um, we, once emergence stopped for an entire week again, we uh, concluded the experiment. So in total, this ran from September 2020 to April 2021, about seven months in total. And as you can see, um, we were very successful, yielding about 3,000 seedlings in total a thousand control from the control sites, 500 from the reference sites, and 1500 about there for the, the treated sites. So now looking at the results, first we'll look at the number of Phragmites australis seedlings that emerged from each of the treatments. So probably the most uh, striking result is here on the left, the number of Phragmites australis seedlings that emerged from the control um, which was the Phragmites australis dense uh, sites. This is maybe to be expected because where you have tons of viable Phragmites plants, you would expect to be to have many viable seeds in the seed bank as well. Um, but the more striking result, I believe, is the um, huge difference between the number of Phragmites australis seedlings that emerged in the moist condition versus in the flooded condition. Um, the flooded condition, as I mentioned, is only two to four centimeters above the soil surface. And you can see that uh, emergence was heavily um, dampened under the uh, flooded condition. So that's really important for management because it shows that uh, once that Phragmites is gone and there's only seeds left, um, those flooded conditions can really help control the spread of Phragmites. And then also very important looking at the treated sites. Um, very few in comparison to the control conditions, very few Phragmites australis seedlings emerged from the treated sites, which is really great news because it shows that once those Phragmites, uh, Phragmites plants are gone, that um, the number of viable Phragmites seeds in the, seed, in the seed bank really decreases, which is really great news. Next, looking at the number of native seedlings. So the number of native, native seedlings that emerged between control reference and treated conditions are all very similar. Um, this is actually really good news as well because it shows that even under dense Phragmites australis, there are still a number of native seedlings that are present in the seed bank that are available to recolonize the area post-treatment. And finally, looking at coefficient of conservatism, this is a measure of how sensitive a species is to its environment, with 10 being the most sensitive, one being the least sensitive, and zero being designated to invasive species. And again, this just goes, goes to show that under control, um, very dense Phragmites australis, that there are still a number of um, native seedlings in that seed bank that are very sensitive to their environment that are very worthy of conservation concern. So finally, conclusions. Um, first of all, low water levels may encourage further Phragmites australis spread in untreated areas, um, shown by that high number of Phragmites australis seedlings that emerged under the control moist conditions. Um, next, that treatment has been effective in reducing viable Phragmites australis seeds. And finally, that viable native seeds continue to persist in the seed bank, still in those in, uh, Phragmites australis dominated sites, which is really great news. 
So my future steps are firstly, I'd like to answer how will emergence differ between vegetation types in situ. So greenhouse experiments like the one I just described are really great because you can uh, control light conditions, you control watering regimes. However, as most of us know, what happens in the greenhouse or in the lab doesn't necessarily translate to the wetland itself. So it'll be really interesting to see how emergence will differ in situ in the wetland itself. And next, I'd like to also answer how will emergence differ in dry conditions. So not necessarily moist conditions like um, the one in the greenhouse, but dry drawdown conditions um, that we are expected to see in the upcoming years. And luckily, both of these questions can be answered via something called a marsh organ, which is what I'm uh, standing next to here in the wetland in this picture here. Um, a marsh organ consists of a series of pipes of different lengths and you fill them with sediment and then put a seed bank sample on top. And so that seed bank sample is actually exposed to lower water levels, the higher the pipe is. So as you can see here, the water level is uh, right around the, uh, you can't actually see them, but the bottommost pipes down here. Um, and so these pipes will be exposed to lower water levels um, throughout the growing season. And so once I have, an actual chance to analyze that data, I will get back to you on how to answer those questions. And back to Rebecca. Thanks, Megan. And apologies for the static again, everyone. Um, but I'm gonna uh, talk just for a few more minutes about some of the new directions this work is taking because we're really at, you know, when we proposed this monitoring plan, we planned to go for five years. We've gone for five years post-treatment plus the, you know, the pre-treatment year to get that baseline condition. Um, and this entire experiment has really been around what I would define as a passive restoration. We haven't done any planting. Uh, we've just allowed that native seed bank um, that Megan described to you know, generate a new vegetation community after Phragmites was suppressed. But um, you know, in, in certain places, people are arguing that active restoration can provide a better outcome it can get you there faster. Maybe you don't have to go through that whole phase of um, secondary invasion that we witnessed. Um, and also with a sort of strategic lens, um, there might be certain prescriptions of plants which would imbue the vegetation community with greater resistance to both those secondary invasions and reinvasion by Phragmites australis. And so um, our next sort of area of inquiry is we wanna look at how we can use um, active restoration strategies to devise plant prescriptions based on um, plant traits that would allow us to maximize the resistance to secondary invasions and reinvasion and really kind of um, enhance the resilience of the vegetation community um, in the area where this restoration activity is taking place. And we're also really interested in how um, this can be used as an example of where ecological restoration can support reconciliation with indigenous peoples. So thinking about plant traits as a biologist, I'm usually thinking about like uh, the leaf economic spectrum and like, uh, you know, vegetative propagule modes and life history traits. And is it um, a nitrogen fixing plant or not? Um, but actually there's a whole other realm of traits we can think about around their spiritual, traditional, medicinal values um, that can also be incorporated. And by coincidence, one of the plants that seems to be um, maybe providing a really good case study um, in resisting invasion by Phragmites is actually wild rice, which is a plant of tremendous importance to Indigenous peoples and um, which is native to this area. And what we're seeing is that where wild rice has recovered in areas after Phragmites was removed, we're not seeing as much reinvasion. So we see this sort of like inverse relationship between the abundance of wild rice and the abundance of Phragmites in these monitoring plots over time. And so we're wondering if that might be a more general phenomenon and whether things like um, actively feeding wild rice might help prevent Phragmites from getting back into the places where we've made this investment um, in its suppression. And so we have a new PhD student in the lab, uh, Jersey, who's going to be taking on this project starting this coming summer. Um, can you advance the slide, Megan? So then the next um, new direction of research 
uh, is actually to expand our focus from, um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about Phragmites, and I know that that's close to the heart of this working group, but um, we've also encountered many other invasive plant species like European frog bit, Eurasian milfoil, and hybrid cattail, which could be um, impacting star or species at risk in this area as well. And so when we're thinking more broadly about invasive species management, how should we be prioritizing um, which species uh, we want to you know, manage and how should we you know, monitoring for invasive species to species at risk. So we have many invasive species on our doorstep um, you know, around the Great Lakes region, which aren't present yet. And we also have these other invasive species which are already established um, and kind of assessing how each of those categories of invasive plants may present risk to, uh, to species at risk um, you know, in, in a more broad sense um, using the uh, conservation standards um, approach is, our, is another new direction that we're taking. And that work is going to be led in our research group by Adam Watkinson, a new postdoc who's just joined our lab. Um, so stay tuned for more information with that. And then the last piece that I'm excited to talk a little bit about is um, a big talk to Michael McTavish, as well as colleagues um, at U of T and, and the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, who have done this fantastic work to lay the groundwork for biocontrol. And um, we're really excited to get to partner uh, with them to look at some of the same measurements of efficacy that we applied in this herbicide-based um, management to, to biocontrol and to start to look at how effective um, these biocontrol agents are at suppressing Phragmites australis under these different environmental conditions, like across different water depths, for example, um, and then how the native plant community responds to that suppression um, hopefully leading ultimately to you know, coexistence with native species with Phragmites. Um, and so that's another new direction of research. And we have a new um, master student who's, who's going to be starting this May um, to begin to look at that work. So really exciting new chapters for um, the Waterloo Wetland Ecology Lab. And I'm going to, um, I think, wrap up, if you go to the next slide, Megan, with, um, with this image. So I know I've shown this image, I think, last year at the AGM, um, but I want to take the opportunity to show it again because it's so powerful, um, at least from my perspective. Uh, this is a painting by Amanda Rosenberg, who went with some of my PhD students into the field at Long Point um, while they were doing uh, some of this monitoring work. And so this is Jody and Courtney, who you may have seen present um, at other times on some of our monitoring. And they're uh, monitoring in a treated plot um, that used to be full of Phragmites. They're looking at the bird community and the plant community. Um, and I like, and they have both since graduated and moved on to fantastic new opportunities. And we're really sad to have lost them, but I think they've made such an important contribution to this research. And reflecting on their contribution has provided me a bit of an opportunity to kind of um, think about key takeaway lessons. Um, from this larger research program that, as I said at the beginning, has actually trained, you know, 18 different uh, graduate students and undergraduate students. And so um, three kind of main takeaways. The first one is, oh, <laughs> yeah, they're all just me rambling. Thanks, Megan. Um, <laughs> just if, if you if you want to leave that beautiful image sure. after. Um, so just that uh, monitoring, you know, is a really long-term investment. It's, it's not a short-term thing. And as I think Megan really clearly showed, the patterns in the data that were revealing themselves after you know, three years of monitoring were not the full story on the outcome of this Phragmites control effort. And a big system like Lake Erie, coastal marsh is gonna change really slowly. It's subject to these decadal cycles and water level, climate cycles, um, and the natural succession you know, of a basically a sandbar um, coastal marsh. So, you know, we need to keep monitoring. Um, initially, the question is, does the fray come back? Um, does native vegetation recover? Uh, or is it sort of usurped by secondary invasions? What happens when water levels go up, when water levels go down? Um, and now we're starting to think about what plant communities might resist the invasion fast and can we use that information to enhance future restoration work? So studies that only collect data for a couple of years 
um, you know, are really common, but they shouldn't be overinterpreted. And, you know, just yesterday I was reading an op-ed in Aurelia Matters uh, by David Hawk, who I know is here. And I think I got the sense, I don't know how many of you saw that, um, but I think I got the sense from him, you know, that people are a bit demoralized by the results of uh, the first few years of monitoring. And it can start to seem really impossible to make a big difference or a lasting difference. Initially, we were certainly very disappointed by the surge in frog bit. Um, if surprised by it, I think it does a good job in emptying a niche, but that wasn't the whole story. And I, I think one of the big takeaways is that native species were able to take over um, given enough time and now most of the plots are dominated by native species, similar to what we find in areas where frag has never invaded. So we're, we're pretty optimistic now. And um, even though we're optimistic now, I would say, I would caution like that's not the whole story because now we're um, poised at a point where lake levels are gonna go down. So that's my takeaway that this has to be a long-term undertaking and you really have to stick it out when you sort of get into monitoring. Um, and I know that not everyone is able to have the luxury that we have had of long-term monitoring, um, you know, for five years or more, but at least when we're reviewing the literature and we're looking at evidence to inform our own land management decisions and our own you know, practice of restoration, that we should be putting greater weight onto those studies which have had that luxury and letting them inform us a little bit more than short-term studies that are really just reporting like those immediate effects. Um, and then the second uh, kind of takeaway has to do with, um, you know, any system that moves slowly and is subject to backroom cycles or, or ecological drift um, in important things like climate, water levels, et cetera. Having control plots that you do not treat is really critical to the integrity of your monitoring. So during this study, you know, pragmatic density declined everywhere in the treated and the not treated sites. But of course, we found that the declines in our untreated control plots were nowhere near as much as what we observed in the treated plots. The control plots let us see how much the treatment changed the plant community above and beyond those natural background changes in Phragmites. So I know it's unpopular to leave stands the Phragmites behind. Um, and I, I know Long Point Provincial Park was certainly very anxious to treat them. Um, and they were treated at the end of 2020. So if you noticed in Megan's plots, you know, we have those control plots, the, I think they were the red um, uh, triangles present up until 2020. And then in 2021, we're only presenting the treated plots um, because those control plots were, were sprayed. But um, having them at least as long as we did really supported the integrity of our monitoring program. And um, it let us be, you know, what I would think of as like research grade rigorous. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to do that without the sort of tremendous partnership and, and them you know, protecting those control plots for us as long as they did. So if you can establish experimental controls as part of your monitoring, do it. Um, and if you're reading about other projects that you know, you're know you using to inform your decisions about your own land management challenges, remember to weigh those ones that have control plots more rigorously um, than you know, short-term uh, uncontrolled uh, project reports. And then the last takeaway that I want to comment on has to do with the results from Megan's seed bank experiment and the sort of preliminary results from the um, marsh organ experiment. And that is the sense I have that we're a little bit sitting on a ticking time bomb because what she found was that um, when we treated the sites, the viability of the frag seeds, which were in the seed bank, was very short term. It doesn't take them more than a couple of years for most of those seeds to become no longer able to germinate. Uh, but in the areas where frag hadn't been treated, there are a lot of seeds. I don't know if you caught how different the axes were when she was showing the plots there about the number of seeds in the, um, you know, of frag versus the number of seeds, seedlings of native plants. But there's a lot of viable frag seed in those um, untreated plots. And once the water levels drop and that seed bank was exposed, they germinated. And so I feel like we are in a bit of a race now um, in coastal marsh on Lake Erie, at least where the water levels are on a trajectory of decline to get treated all those locations that are going to otherwise become 
sources to reinvade, um, you know, all the areas where we have successfully um, removed trichomyces. So those are my three big takeaways. Um, and then I was just going to go to the last slide uh, with some acknowledgments. And um, Megan and my email addresses in our, in our Twitter, if you like to tweet, you know, follow us on Twitter. Uh, we often post updates about our papers and photos from the field there. Uh, but we invite you, know, you to reach out to us if you have any questions or you want access to some of the papers we published. I know they're behind a paywall and I'm happy to, please don't pay for them. I'm happy to share them for free. You just email us. Um, and yeah, and, and answer any questions. I know I saw some coming up in the chat. So um, I can read them to you and then we can see where we go from there. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you both so, so much. Um, this work is just so important and it's just so applicable to um, those who are doing planning and budgeting for this type of work. It's so many important things to think about there. So you've given us a lot um, to kind of work with. Um, and there's been a lot of questions that have come in. So I'll just jump right to it here. David is asking, is there a plan to control Phragmite, or sorry, to control frog bit after Phragmite's removal? Is it controllable? There, there is not currently a plan to control um, frog bit, no. Um, and whether it's controllable or not, I mean, not, uh, it's not, glyphosate has not been very effective on frog bit. Other like herbicides, I think from the Amazapur family um, might be more effective on it. Um, and there's definitely some, some research that's been done about what herbicides can be used to control frog bit. But um, what we have found is actually that we did, we probably don't need to control it if we're patient. Um, in our plots, at least, it seems to be displaced um, by native species with enough time and with um, you know helpful water levels. As those water levels go down, I think we'll see less of it because it likes standing water. Um, so I think you know, maybe active restoration might circumvent the need to worry about it at all. If we were in a situation where once we removed Phragmites, we immediately seeded with something like wild rice, that would create a lot of competition for that um, European uh, frog bit. And I think might help sort of shield or protect um, the native plants. Um, so that's an area that we're really excited to be exploring. Excellent, that's great to hear. All right, uh, Kayla is asking, was there a significant amount of other invasive seedlings present in the seed bank? Could the seed bank be used to inform whether a secondary invasion may occur after treatment? Yeah, so I'll take this one. Um, unfortunately, with the, the constraints that we had in the greenhouse, like the, the flooded conditions only had, were like, were placed in little plastic cups. And so those conditions aren't really conducive for um, submerged aquatic vegetation to grow. Um, I did find a bit of frog bit and tons of cattail, which is um, presumed to be invasive in the sites that we were looking at. Um, so maybe cattail would be, that would be a great way to determine how much cattail would come back. However, with frog bit and um, milfoil, invasive milfoil, those aren't uh, great to grow in the greenhouse. So um, like I said, with cattail, that might be a really good idea, but with the conditions that we're facing in the greenhouse, maybe not so much for the other invasives. Fair enough. Um, Stephen is asking, not clear to me, is there is the secondary invasion temporary and will it become mostly native over time or does it all require control? So I know you touched on this a little bit, but maybe if you want to just reiterate. So what we've just been seeing is that that transition has been totally natural from invasive uh, frog bit primarily to those native species. Um, so as, as Rebecca mentioned, perhaps all it, it takes this time. However, um, in ecology, if, it, if I've learned one thing, it's that what happens in one site is not necessarily applicable to another. So um, if we face this again, maybe extra treatment may be required, but uh, what we've experienced in our uh, study sites is that time is all, is all we needed to get back to that native vegetation. 
Excellent. That's very promising. <laughs> All right. Um, Kirk Kowalski is saying, great job, Megan. Frogbit was quick to spread after frag treatment, but declined with time. So he's saying the same thing. Yeah. Uh, do you attribute that to high water levels? Uh, turions couldn't grow, for example, or wave action in open water or something else? Yeah, we don't know, Kurt. Like, I think that that's, um, it's, yeah. <laughs> I think it's hard to say. I mean, I think that what happened was, um, because it's a floating plant, it was really able to get in there rapidly when um, the emergent plants were removed. But that over time, you know, more emergent plants have um, germinated, and especially as the lake levels are going down, we're seeing more germination of, of emergent plants. Um, and so it's just being outcompeted. That's what I think is happening. But again, we, you know, we didn't design this study to test that. It was sort of an unanticipated outcome. Um, but it is promising that it has just kind of. Uh, it's really like I, I'm thinking of the state and transition approach. I know you thought Sam Banks is in the audience too, but that the um, you know we're really seeing them like tick over into this more native dominated state, and I think it's probably competition dynamics ultimately supported by um, the water levels. Um, okay, Stephen is asking: Was there only one treatment in 2017, or are there annual treatments? Um, to the best of my knowledge, the main treatment took place in 2016, followed by in 2017, there was a mix of aerial treatment via helicopter and ground treatment via Marshmaster. Um, so those were in different areas. Um, and to the, the best of my understanding, there has been some spot treatment in um, more dense areas in the past couple of years. So it's all ground-based. Um, spot treatment in the areas where these treatment plots were. Um, but then we didn't show this year, but I have in past years shown. So maybe there's some, some people remembering that we also compared sites that were treated in 2017, um, that some were treated aerially and some were treated by ground to compare the efficacy um, of that initial treatment. And we have also continued to monitor those plots, but we weren't talking about them today. So much to cover, so little time. <laughs> um, okay, Janice is asking, with regard to frog bit, do you think nutrient levels might play a big role in whether their density will decline over time? Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, so like we've also collected from each of these plots every year, we've collected sediment samples and um, we've analyzed them for nutrients uh, and we've actually just seen completely no patterns at all. <laughs> so um, I don't know about the, like, I, I mean, I doubt there's a big difference in um, water level nutrients in, in the Lake Erie water over this time, but we did notice kind of anecdotally a change in, um, in the texture of the sediment. We found that a lot of the organic material seems to be lost after Phragmites was removed. But um, when we actually analyze the um, phosphorus and nitrogen content of the soils, we're not seeing any trends and the uh, measurements of loss of, of organic matter um, from the sediment is ongoing. So I don't know if we've seen any like, statistically um, st significant change in the organic content. Um, and that might just be a, you know, our anecdotal observations from the field. But um, so I'm not sure that the nutrient um, levels can be used to explain the pattern that we've seen in terms of uh, frog bit. I mean, I know that frog bit likes high nutrient levels, and you know Lake Erie has high nutrient levels, um, but whether there's been enough of a change to kind of explain the ecological dynamics, I don't know. Okay, great, thank you. Were the study sites mainly in wadeable areas or were some boat access, i.e. could you couldn't stand in the plot? So for each of these sites, they were definitely gladly accessible by waders. Um, we would use the boat to go to the sites, but to get those seed bank samples, we needed to use that soil core. So in some sites, we're like up to our armpits in the, in the water, trying to get the, the soil cores. Um, but yeah, they're all uh, primarily accessible by uh, walking. Excellent. 
Excellent. You got a lot of uh, a couple little applauses for that. So I think uh, people appreciate that hard work. <laughs> yeah, I should be applauding Matt and uh, uh, I guess Marissa, Matt and Marissa on here. They they did most of the work for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's excellent. All right. Um, one last question here. What native veg? Oh, actually, another one popped in here. Native vegetation species seem to possibly outcompete the frog bits. A lot of interest in frog bit. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, when I was looking at the data, primarily the, the species that were out competing the frog bit were mostly um, Nauseous flexilis, which is nodding water nymph, and um, Elodea canadensis, which is Canadian water weed. So those were the ones that I was seeing most often. Also, things like um, American white water lily was also quite common, um, and some uh potamogeton species so some uh it's been a minute since i've not said them in the, their latin names a but pondweed pond. pondweed yeah pondweed species um that were also replacing that frog bit excellent very cool very interesting to know all right and janice just says thank you really interesting re research best of luck in the field megan and rebecca thank and you let me just check the chat, make sure there's not any last ones. Just a lot of thank you, great work. I'll let you guys um, read the chat, but a lot of thank yous for your excellent work. It's so important to informing um, what people are doing on the ground. So thank you. Thank you. Don't get into demoralization, you guys. Um, I think it can work out. You just have to be patient and, um, you know, and maybe adopt a bit more of an active strategy in restoration. Yeah, I think it's safe to say Phragmites is a marathon, not a race, so, or Phragmites management. So anyway, yes, thank you so much.